to Jai Long and this is Make Your Break. Whether you're a big-hearted creative or an aspiring entrepreneur, let's take action on your dreams. Reconnecting you with your why and giving you the how. I'm here to dish out actionable mindset tips and fun industry secrets to help you blow up your biz. From eye-opening reality checks to motivational gold, no two episodes are ever the same. So tune in weekly, skip the FOMO, and let's dive into the deep together. Hello, hello, hello. Okay. Check, check, check. Check, check, check. I'm here with Ziggy. We're going to have a big conversation today about music, his career, all the things he's been up to. Welcome. How are you? I thought I'd hit all the cliches and I would turn up in boardies with sandy feet. No, and I'm zinc. Sure. Yeah, and zinc. I yeah. think I got some of it off. <laughs> yeah, I've spent spent all of too much time in the sun the last couple of days. So, That's awesome. Uh, you know, it's uh, it's good to do these things before you do a podcast just to make sure you know staying true to roots. Yeah. You know, it's really interesting, um, like when you listen to your music and everything, I think a lot of people imagine you just surfing all the time. Is that true? Is that all that happens? No. <laughs> <laughs> it's a conversation I was just having with a friend um, yesterday. I've had this conversation the last couple of days with different musos and different people in town. It's definitely, um, yeah, I'd say very blue collar. And so I'm lucky to have a lot of um, more free time these days, I guess. Mm. But I still tend to feel it because I just love, um, I do love getting after it. And there can be a bit of a, perception with uh, music or arts that being excited about business and trying to do well and um, I guess really hustle which mm. is I guess maybe something that's quite common in maybe um, more of the American music scene so to speak um, but for me it's like I always um, you know that 10,000 hours that 10,000 hours kind of rule was something that always was on my mind and still applies today yeah Hey, you know, um, what I want to ask you and what I sort of want to dive down, like we, I actually did homeschooling as well for a long time. and I know you did homeschooling. Um, and I actually want to dive into like when you first started your career as a musician, uh, what business knowledge did you actually have? Or did you have some sort of naivety that kind of helped you believe that there was no rules and you could go in and essentially create your own label and build your own career? So just homeschool what do you think that's how do you think that's affected your whole career so i think homeschooling so i was homeschooled till i was 13 didn't sit inside a classroom um you know i do remember one of the first first classes i turned up at and i had long blonde surfy hair at this time so people didn't know that i was like the nerd that i was and (laughs) so i was so you know i slipped into the the system pretty fine um i feel really immensely grateful to have had that, those formative years particularly as like you know in some ways like in some ways girls at that age are also a lot tougher and grow up more quickly mm-hmm. truly i think that's the case and so i think if you're a creative guy i think it can be um something that you you could get squashed you know because you're trying to fit in and you're trying to amongst your peers but i didn't have to do that as much i was lucky to have a big family very supportive um kind of of us being unique individuals and that was a beautiful thing homeschooling gave us this outside kind of perspective where i guess we you didn't know the rules i've talked about this as a Mm. bit of a theme the last couple of days when you don't know the rules you don't have to learn how to break them totally and that's like and that's an immense gift you know because instead of this is the way it's done this is how you start your career this is how things have to be Mm. when you approach it with that um naivety or the, um, the innocence and the, the lack of knowledge it's mm. something that it, you don't have to then say okay well that chord can't come after this chord i didn't know i still don't know i yeah. still don't know technica i still only play by ear still only um largely like i don't know the keys that a lot of my songs are unless someone tells me um i still don't know the rules and that to me is really important when it comes to trying to innovate because that mental barrier of this is how things are and how they have always been and how they always will be is something that's an immense thing in, in, I think an immense thing in all industry, but creative, um, you know, what I have knowledge of in a creative industry has been 
hugely powerful to not be to not to not know the rules and therefore i did not have to learn how to break them first. yeah there's so much unlearning to do for people you know because like a lot of people don't realize like when you go to school you are taught to stand in line put up your hands wear the same thing as everybody else you get in trouble if you do wrong or if you don't do any good in your grades things like that and i know for myself I was never told no or I can't do or I'm doing it wrong or I never failed a test because I didn't really do tests and things like that. And so, you know, for myself, going into being a creative business owner, I find it so easy because I think so different. I don't have to unlearn a lot of things that a lot of us are kind of constrained to. Absolutely. And just to think like for the three years I went to school and even noticing your kind of subconscious shift on how things are, that's tw- imagine 12 years of that 12 years of this is how things are and this is how oh, it's yeah. going to be and you're going to have to go to uni to have to do this you know and also people investing 12 years of their young lives and families investing those 12 years of their children's lives and family family lives to then have to have to inverted commas go to university mm-hmm to then get a job like if you think about this expanse of that and as far as i'm only it's 10 years this summer that i quit my last job to do music explicitly and only you know like that was the last time 2011 2012 when i just picked up the guitar and just started playing i um was working cafe jobs and picked up gigs pretty quickly just doing little uh, little cafe shows and little restaurant shows and you know, but 10 years, you know, like if I had taken the uni route, so to speak, which isn't the wrong way, it's just to say that it's... This is a very different way. It's a very different way, but like, let's say I did that for the first four years or five years. Like, man, the first four or five years so were so important. Mm. You know, some of the most important years of my career thus far has been those first five years, you know, thinking from 2000 and let's say from 2013 you know, when I quit my last job and just was going to do music somehow some way and um to think about that to 2018 i mean they're also the years that you had the most hustle in you huh like you'd finish school and literally nothing there's no fear you've got nothing to lose and everything to gain and if you're sitting in the classroom with all that energy built up like it would be pretty hard for you to come out and have that same hustle and same drive that blue blue collar mentality, like this is something like, and th- but this is just for for me personally. Um, but you know, people still now, still now, people are partying, and I will be there writing songs. You know, yeah. like I'd finish the show and write songs, and I would do. I would drive. I was telling one of the guys in town last night. I was like, I would play a show in Byron at night, busk on a Friday night at, at Mocker on Lawson Street, and then I would drive to Sunshine Coast or you know, sometimes I'd drive to Sunshine Coast, play a morning market mm. and I'd drive back and play another gig in Byron yeah. on Sunday, you know, like, you know, like I was just... Because you're hungry for hell it. Hell for leather going yeah. for it and put myself, you know, there's something about swinging the bat, you know, and you just get better. You, you through that repetition, give yourself the best shot, you know, and I was an on the go learner, you know, different people learn differently. You have to see what works for you. And for me, sometimes it is best that I don't know because then... I have less fear and more perhaps creativity to a situation mm. and that really helped me when I, um, it, that was just the way that I naturally learned and for sure it's no, there's very few accidents, man, when it comes to music. Like you do watch, you put your best foot forward and you are, and I have been immensely lucky. There's, there's no cool. question about it. But when you add in hard work and you see like, you know, Dermot Kennedy comes to mind, for example, who I don't know um, that well, but know his drummer pretty well, Mihaw Quinn. And basically, you know, I watched them play to 100 people in Mm. Oslo in 2018, maybe January 2018 in the snow. I watched them play to 100 people and they now are the biggest, you know, Irish act ever. Yeah. You know, and like these guys just hustled. And so there's definitely sometimes, I just don't think there's anything that's had that through this the one thing that maybe has stayed the same through our multiple generations and things that have changed is that there is very for, for responsible um, and ongoing, you know, sustainable business kind of practice where you have a good footing in your chosen career. That kind of doesn't, that kind of putting in the work and it being 10, like 10 years, mm. I've been working pretty hard at this, like really hard. Yeah, yeah. And that's why I have what I have and that kind of, 
to some people, it looks like it was an overnight thing, but it's, you know, it just was not <laughs> yeah. at all. As I'm sure you can relate with your Oh, work. yeah, man. It's the overnight success. I took my whole life to get that overnight <laughs> success. Like, it's so funny. Um, when, when you first started and you're sort of going into all this and we sort of established, like, your actual background in, uh, in education and things like that, just learning on the go, did you have any business knowledge whatsoever? And what did that look to you? And it did it even look like a business? Or were you just like, I need to make a thing happen? And that was basically the thought process you had. At first, it was like, uh, at first, my logic was really sound. It was that I was going to be just as broke, but have more time to surf. Yeah. So that was my first solid career see, choice. See, that's what I love to hear, though, because like, I think so many people overcomplicate everything. But like my first business was the same thing. I was like selling, I had a cafe, so I was selling coffee. So I was like, if I sell it for more than it cost me to make, then I've got a business and that's all it was. Exactly. And I think that's something <laughs> that can be lost in particularly in music, for example, is that that kind of really, okay, if I can buy this many CDs yep. like, and I can, if I got to sell a hundred of them mm -hmm. to break even, okay, then I've got a business. Like I will be able to put, because I, I had to put fuel in my car, you know, I yeah. lived in my, lived in my van at that time. You know, well, when I, once I bought a van, I lived in my van. So like, it was very, there was no backstop in that sense. And so I was super pragmatic and that's what led me to do house shows and backyard shows because I could try and get paid 200 bucks maybe, mm -hmm. maybe from the pub who didn't necessarily want to book me because I didn't do covers. Or if I could play to 10 people. If I played to, t if I played to 20 people at 10 bucks, which is what I would do at the start, yeah. that was the same, but the environment was better, more mm -hmm. intimate, actually made lasting connections with these people. And so again, allowed you my, to be creative as well. With it your wasn't own music. how am I going to, you know, how am I going to, how is this going to be some, it, I really did take a pretty quality, um, a quality approach when it came to the settings that I wanted people to be in with me. Yeah. And, but my version of quality was something that was intimate, you know, it wasn't the place that was fancy. It was like backyards and yeah. houses, but it was stuff that was very make believe and, um, I guess, not normal against the rules yeah you know, stuff that people just weren't doing at least you know that we had matt corby and nick saxon who took me on the first house show you know something that's very popular now but at that time it was still no one was doing it probably consistently and that's where i was like okay well okay so then i don't have to ask the pub for money there's no rules there's no rules you know yeah. and and we were creating these really beautiful memories where um you know there was a lot of trust involved there was strangers I was turning up to strangers' houses, mm. host other strangers in their freaking house. Yeah. You know, and that's incredible. But we all took that leap of trust together and then like, and then you're all rewarded. Yeah. And so it was just like, a, yeah, it was a really um, beautiful thing. And it was something that was just a really exciting, uh, unfolding journey. I didn't have a big plan, but a lot of those, like you just kind of touched on those very simple, pragmatic, like, because again, like I, I, it was, I committed at 18 which yep. is crazy. I think at 18, I was like, I'm going this is going to be my, like, I'm going to do it. You know, and I had a Corolla, a guitar and like, a, like a busking PA. Yeah. You know, I didn't even have that. Like I hadn't, I had nothing. I had no grounds to stand on that I was going to pull it off. Mm. Um, but to me, it was some of the most joyous moments, you know, when you take those risks and you free fall and, um, you know, I had nothing to lose and everything to gain. And I was lucky to have my folks who, backed me up on that and as the business grew I just dragged people into it as far as so once I created um, a big enough problem I had twice because at first I was self-managed self-booked totally produced the CDs organized the invoices set up the events online um, I at one point you know I did it all which was unsustainable in yeah, every of sense course. of the word but I created a big enough ecosystem in ecosystem yeah that's yeah. a better word so saying problem like i created an ecosystem that required two people yeah then i could afford my sister who's still my um you know who i co-founded the label with it's um, amazing you know she in 2015 started managing me and still my manager today and that's i created this kind of ecosystem or microsystem enough to have that and then once we grew that out got my dad involved who's had to you know, decades of experience in being an entrepreneur and mm. a business owner himself um, in IT in particular, which is hilarious. You know, so he, we dragged him in at first on a bit of accounting and then we dragged him in as a CFO and then got the auntie to come in when we started the label and it's just been this kind of, you know, um, 
Just bringing everyone along the ride with you. Yeah. 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 So I, I, I like my job now is to like provide some ideas, make the mess, go tour and then, you know, <laughs> stay healthy and happy for the people. Yeah. I love that. You know, when um, most people sort of start out um, when they're doing anything. So I know a lot of people will go like, I'm going to go and play at the pub and then hopefully someone's going to see me play from a record label and then they're going to give me a deal or hopefully someone's going to tell their friend that they've seen someone and there's a lot of hope and chance and stuff like that. And I feel like with your approach of just going like, well, if I am the record label, then I can give myself a chance and make my own break. Um, and then from there, I'm going to obviously get bigger problems and with bigger problems, I'm going to have bigger solutions and with bigger solutions, you know, everything sort of grows. So for you, um, instead of being fixated on looking for a record deal, did you ever think of like, well, nothing's ever going to stop me. I'm just going to do it myself. I think um, I look at so many moments and I'm so glad that I hadn't thought through all of what was sensible and reasonable and let things unfold you know yeah. that was important it's important to think through a lot of things and it was important to seek guidance on stuff where it's pretty black and white i.e legal stuff but i had this really ironically punk mentality where i was like doing all ages shows mm. in, like i was big on all ages gigs and um because i was 16 graduated because i got to finished school a year early from being homeschooled. So I was 16, um, getting paid cash, glassing at a, you know, collecting glasses at a music bar, you know, and I felt that I couldn't see music mm. for like a year and a half with all the people that I went to school. I couldn't even go see music. Mm. You know, and I worked in a music venue at that time, you know, and long story short is like, so that was a passion thing for me. And then I just was really... Um, I actually was like, re I like, I like I say, ironically, and not to the, you know, I always had the, um, the blonde surf, you know, singer songwriter thing, but I was really punk in my approach. Like I was really protective of. I just want to play music to people direct. Yeah. I want to cut out all the noise, the middleman. I didn't want the articles. I didn't want the label. I actually kind of despised that, totally. and I was like, I'm playing music with my people, and I do not care to have any of you and the toxic industry involved yeah and thank goodness i've been by necessity also matured a little bit enough to see it's not all toxic because now we are a part of the industry we are a fully fledged independent label and publishing house so now we are in, in and working with other independents and you know so it's not all that but at that time i was just really protective and really um that was my goal was like to play direct to people, you know, and we were, I remember doing, um, you know, the Palais in yeah, Melbourne, yeah, yeah, you know, course. and sold out the Palais in like 2017 mm -hmm. without radio, without wow. any marketing budget, that is without anything, venue. you know, we're still with like, with like, I don't know how big our team, we hadn't formed the label. So like maybe two, like uh, two or three people in total like crazy stuff mm. but it was just direct to people and it was really underground and like immensely grassroots and it was just this super quality group of people that really championed my music that i owe um you know that we did it it was our, it was our thing that we grew together as i just lapped the country we just kept growing into bigger venues and it was just this kind of um and so it just wasn't in my interest to pander um, to that I was just like because also this is the other thing in a really pragmatic sense what more could I have wanted as in so oh, for like, sure. I, I bought I got to buy the bigger van you know and I was committed to touring so I got to buy a bigger van that was safer to drive it was like better to sleep and all those things I still you know it's parked out the front now I still got it and like I had that I was doing something I loved I was surrounded by people I really cared about that I was touring with you know once you know a couple of years in I could afford to have those people on the road so like what more did i want kind of mm. thing like i wasn't th that wasn't a stepping stone that was like everything i wanted i was achieving by playing to 50 people in a backyard and yeah. i'm lucky because maybe 10 years on that would get old but each step of the way i haven't been like oh, this is the one, one thing in music i've had a certain amount of grace that in other areas of my life, for sure, sometimes you like look and you want to do better in this area. You want to do better there. You want to iron out your creases. But when it's come to music, I've largely just felt, um, I've largely felt immensely just blessed. And none of those, none of those steps were things that were just to get somewhere. 
Yeah. They were the thing. They were what I was going for. Yeah. And as a result, people felt that. And, you know, so my, I've been saying this a little bit of late, but I was doing A for A. It wasn't A for B. It wasn't I'm doing this to get the big record label deal. It's mm. like, I'm doing this for doing this. This is the point. This is the end game. And that's, um, that's something that was just natural to me. And if in music, not in all areas of my life, but in music was natural to me. And I feel... I'm grateful to have stumbled upon that because I think I owe even now um, what I what I enjoy so much about my career I, I owe to that mindset it's like I'm not like right now I'm not looking to because we don't know what we're asking for so I could be bigger mm-hmm. what does that mean can I still sleep in my van at the caravan park like what more can I ask for I played with Jack Johnson around Australia and I'm still sleeping in my van like I have immense freedom good people around me get to go surfing, I'm healthy. You know, so we, m- we must be careful what we ask for because I've also been in positions and you've been in positions where you've got on paper what everyone wants and everyone around you would perceive as the thing to have and that's, that only means so much you sleep in the same bed at night, mm, you know. Of course. So it's, I've been happy to see that early on and been given insight to just how much that is true and how you sleep in the same bed whether you play to 100 people or 2,000 people you know and um, so you got to do your your work and your time and your relationships and your balance outside of your career you have to have those things otherwise it's just those things are nice but they're not everything it's real interesting I've got this um I've like shared this concept before a few places where I've talked about um, even though I grew up in like government housing and you know we, we just had no money and everything I've always perceived myself as rich and so people never really understand this concept but I've, I've always said like man like I, I was rich when I was young we had so much love like I was rich when I got my first job and I was getting paid three dollars an hour like I was rich the first time I did my apprenticeship and I was getting five dollars an hour I was rich you know when I bought my first car that was seven shades of yellow and everyone's always seen me lucky and being rich but what people don't realize is I was the one that decided I was rich. It wasn't anyone else deciding. And so because I decided it, people believed it as well because, well, I mean, what else can you be, right? And so it sounds like it's sort of the same for you. It's like, well, I've decided I'm successful when I play to 20 people in the backyard. I decided that, so I am successful. And then from there, the next thing is like, I sold out the Palais Theatre. I am successful like you know and so as the bar rises it doesn't really sound like you're trying to chase a bigger thing but you have been successful from when no one was listening all the way through your whole career and it's still continuing to go that way would you agree on that I think yeah like you yeah you said it really eloquently it's and I don't know you know I've I've thought about how to you know I've thought about how do you how do you instill that now that's like you know I've because I've tried to communicate this I've tried to communicate this concept of like because I did I just felt that way I can't say why I think because if you're particularly in music if you're experienced with shows if it's based on a numbers game let's say with people then the more people the better the more successful mm. but if it's based on um something more personal and something that involves a quality of connection or perhaps it's how you've managed to unveil more of yourself in songwriting i was i wasn't in germany playing to you know 20 30 people in this dj lawyer's house in hamburg chris was his name who's a legend (laughs) yeah Chris super dunker um I wasn't there on my first show in Hamburg going no one's here I can't believe this thing I was there going there's 30 people in someone's house that want to hear you you know and like so that's a yeah that's man that's it's so powerful when that's the case and like I said I feel so and I don't know I think you know upbringing certainly helps and it just it it i think for a long time i've just known that you can play and maybe those that run in 2017 where i was just really burnt out like immensely burnt out to mm. been going too hard too long and it didn't matter that was such a blessing in hindsight because i was playing to thousands of people mm. sold out the best venues i've ever played and i was like 
couldn't have been more unhappy. It was the biggest cliche in the world. I was just so broken. I wasn't even unhappy. I was just void of um, life force, you know. Mm. And so it didn't matter. It made it worse. So it's like, here is these people. And I don't even feel like I can give as much as I want to give to them right now. And so then, then what does it matter when you've got 3,000 people there? And so I guess that's where as soon as it becomes about numbers, you know, as soon as it becomes about the amount of people and – I mean, there's people who do – there's people doing better than me all the time. There's people, Always. You know, like, there's, there's people I know who are, doing, who are doing better than me on all sorts of, on all sorts of levels. But, like, again, I, we ask – we, th- we ask for one thing and we don't see the world that we're asking for, you know. We mm. ask, we can ask for so many things and we ask for an aspect. We don't ask for the whole picture. And so, like, I still have my freedom right now to, like, be here on the North Coast just cruising, literally cruising in my van, which is still something that is immensely, f- that is my freedom. Yeah. That is a part of my freedom. And if that was taken away, I would have to learn to adapt but I'm so happy that I can do that, you know. And so to ask to ask to be, let's say, um, I don't know that even more people in Australia knew. Let's say, let, let's say, I was like, oh, right, three or four times the amount of people need to know in Australia. Like, would I be able to do that, mm. or would I have to live somewhere more private? Would I have to be a more private person? And so, yeah, I think maybe I'm just going through a phase at the moment where I'm like, be careful what you ask for because you might ask. Uh, I think you are. You think you know what you're asking for, but you might. You might not. And well, you know what's interesting? Um, it's funny, like, I think, I feel like we'd both share this, but um, people like yourself, I've met quite others with the same kind of mindset, but we're always more scared of success than we are of failure. And so it's so interesting, and not many people understand this, but failure, there is, you're not scared of failure because, I mean, you, how can you even fail? Unless you give up. Like, there is no such thing as failure, right? Like, you, you're going to keep going up, and you're going to do the show, and you do the things, but then success... Like we think about that more so because it's like, oh man, that's going to change my life. Or I don't know how to deal with it because I've never seen it in my life. I've never seen anyone that I know being that successful or like whatever it is, right? So then it's a whole new path that you have to forge yourself and it's so scary. And I actually see a lot of people, and this is including myself, I hold myself back a lot just because of that fear and I, and I recognize that in myself and I'm always continually thinking like, how can I get past this? And I know it's simply the fact that I just haven't seen anyone do it before and I'm finding that hard. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, it's so, it's so funny and you do see that in people who often maybe have achieved, achieved something, you know, like to see, but like you said, scared of that success and what does that mean and how do things change and it is a new path and, it is crazy, you know, like there is, you know, because when you look to it, there are few fewer examples of the Jack Johnsons, for example. Mm. There's fewer examples of that sort of person. There really is who is that immensely successful in music. And there's many examples of people who are, you know, um, really successful in their career, but their home life is trashed or their like, their well-being is not like is, is completely out of whack. And, and it is easy and I also find it hard to not be like, can you have it all? You know, and that's mm. a big, ch- like I've had to check in on myself a couple of times to be like, hey, like you could, it doesn't just, I think when you like, I think also when you're used to grinding and you're used to just being like hustling, it's also sometimes like let let certain things be easy, you know? Yeah. And luckily with music, again, with music, <laughs> I've not, I've let songs songs coming to me or songs um i've not been too scared of them being something people might like whereas it's easy in easy in music to be like well i need other musicians to like it. and that doesn't mean other people like it, it doesn't even mean mm. you like it and so it is it is uh you know i wonder how many things are forged by like can i have it all because i feel like because i feel like i have so much like can i also have all those things that i dream of yeah. those private dreams can i have that as well you know and you know the answer for the answer for all of us is probably yes but for sure getting over that hurdle of being like well i have all these things can i it's the mindset that you dare, get through can yeah. i dare to have more than i've mm. got now you know and for me when that comes to mind it's like the things that represent more that come to mind are so like 
so personal and just how you feel. And it's lucky. I mean, again, it's lucky to maybe, maybe, maybe I can afford that existential, you know, existential crisis kind of thing. Perhaps I can afford it because I'm lucky that I'm not, I don't put a lot of stress around how my music needs to do. Mm. I've noticed that I kind of don't let there be a lot of like, Expectations. I've caught myself, like, it's funny, I'll find myself really caught up on something. Like, let's say just before a tour, I'll be really caught up on some other business, like, challenge. Really, really caught up on it. Really upset about it. And I've come to realize, I'm like, okay, I'm just deflecting. Like, I'm just a bit nervous about this whole tour. I just need to, like, sit down, ask for a pat on the back, have a little cry. And, like, it's just funny, like, seeing that. But, like, it's a really precious place where I'm, like, don't like to be stressing out about how it needs to be, Mm. you know? Um, And I'm glad for that because there's just, I mean, even this last 18 months, the amount of, you know, well, the last three or four years, but the last 18 months, the twists and turns of my music and things have happened I wouldn't have expected, including touring with Jack around Australia. Like that's stuff that like wasn't on my radar. Mm. Recorded at Abbey Road late last year in maybe like September, never on my radar. I never even had it on my bucket list, you know? Um, and the opportunity came, came up and I was like, oh, yeah, I'll do that. You know, yeah. to a South Africa, it was just stuff that, and so being open to the way things might go is yeah. like so important, so, so important. And um, I'm happy. I, and I wonder, I'd like to know if it's the case for you. Like, do you feel like there's any avenue? Music's been the avenue for me that's like taught me a lot about, I guess, um, letting things happen not holding it's i've not stood in my own way a lot with music largely i've stood i've let things actually be as good as they can possibly be mm. is there is there something in your life that's been like that that you've I, leaned on as an example yeah for sure i think um i've got this thing that i like to say because a lot of people when i was growing up throughout my whole life always says jai you're so lucky i said i oh, know i'm always in the right place at the right time all the time because for myself like I make sure that I am in the right place at the right time all the time so I'm very much like I go with the flow of everything but I, I know the fact that um, if I'm not even in the room nothing's going to happen for me and so of course I was in the right place I didn't know what was going to happen in that room but the fact that I uh, w- what my effort was was like getting over my insecurities and my self-doubts extroverting myself into a space meeting people talking to people or just being there or whatever it is And then hearing what the opportunities are and then having the courage to say yes to things. And I think that in myself is probably one of the qualities I love about myself because it gets myself so far forward. But um, I do feel like in your situation, it's the same thing. Like you're in the right place at the right time all the time. And people don't realize that you're living in your van, driving around Australia like for 10 years to be in that position, to be in the right place at the right time all the time. And so for myself, like... um, Oh, have an, an example would be like, I remember there was a wedding, it was in Chicago, and they're like, can you come and fly to my wedding? Like, it's in Chicago, blah, blah, blah. And I said, I'm, I'm actually there in Chicago on that date, just worked out. And of course, I lied. I quickly jumped on my computer and I booked a flight and I got myself to Chicago for that date. So I happened to be at the right place at the right time for that thing. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's like having the willingness to, like, even if it didn't work out, it doesn't matter. I've always backed myself and I'm, and I'm willing to put myself into those places. Which I find is really interesting, even with, um, with your career and like the mindset that you have of like where you are now and pushing forward and finding opportunities all the time or allowing opportunities to come to you. Like you didn't even see that Jack Johnson was on the horizon for you, you know, for this last tour in this last year. But you did put yourself in the position to allow that to happen. And it took 10 years worth of work plus to be conditioned to say, even to say yes to something like that because too many people would fall back on their insecurities maybe there's too many rules there's things in a way um there's so many other implications maybe they're already busy with something else and had other commitments they couldn't move things around where i feel like when someone like yourself is like well i do but i'm moving things i'll move heaven and earth and we're making this happen that luckiness i think would be a common tying thread you know in my one of my favorite quotes my sister has as as a sign off it's probably my Yes, if not one, of, it's it's in, it's one of my favorite quotes of all time. It's by Seneca, mm-hmm. um, this Stoic um, writer from from eons ago, and it's a uh, luck is where opportunity meets preparation. 
Yeah. And that for me just says it all. And when I say I'm lucky, I mean it in both. I feel I've been like, you know, you're blessed. Blessed. And I equally feel like I had prepared an opportunity presented itself, you know. And I think like a fun, a fun, a fun story that's very vivid for me was in 2015, the first time I went to Europe and went on a, was it another backpacking trip with my family? Something really specific. Maybe we went on a backpacking trip to Europe. Mum was coming. Mum went back to Hungary for the first time. We all went, and basically, took my guitar, box of CDs, my backpack. I said, hey, I've got a free weekend. Would anyone host me in Norway? Um, just do a little backyard show. And basically, you know, the years prior, the two years prior, 2013, 14, 15, I'd been primarily busking in Byron and playing these little cafe shows every night and playing the Northern Front Room, you know, 9 to 12 on a Monday or a Tuesday. And, you know, these and the sisters would come along and one of them was Amelia, who's now, you know, um, you know now a good friend. And they would come along. She worked at... She worked at one of the other stores and that was like the locals would come down on like a Monday or Tuesday because everyone's working hospital over the weekend. They'd come see these shows and she reached out when I put this post up. Hey, like I can come to Norway this weekend. Would anyone host a show? And she said, yeah, I can. I would love to, you know, and when I realized who it was, like this is a familiar face, fantastic. Halfway across the world. So I fly there. And we're on the train to Larvik, which is about three hours south of Oslo, to do this house show, which to our knowledge was the first house concert in the like town that had ever happened. And in the on, country. Yeah. <laughs> in the, yeah, let's say in the country. We'll fact check that later. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was in Larvik, to our knowledge, you know, like this, yeah. little, this little coastal town. And on the way there, I'm there with, um, you know, a colleague of hers, and we're on the train and someone the following day has cancelled at the festival that's that weekend in Oslo. Mm. And the person I'm on the train with is Amelia. And um, no, Amelia's in love. But the person I'm on the train with who's like assisting me to get to where I'm going, his cousin's the booking agent for the festival. And he goes, well, I'm actually on the train with this Australian artist who's doing this backyard show. And so next thing you know, I'm playing this Norwegian festival and wow. met the person that then I'd booked my first Norwegian tour with. Like, and that all happened trailing it back. That was all because, like, I decided to turn up and bust. Yeah. It's because I decided to do that. And from literally playing on the street, that was how mm. that happened. You know, like, that's, that's, that's crazy amazing, to think. Right? You know, that's crazy to think, you know, because... You, you happen to be in the right place at the right time right at place, that time. Right <laughs> time. You know, and that's one of the best examples I can... Yeah. I mean... That's one of the best examples I can possibly. You know, there's actually too many. There's too many of those. I feel like your whole career be built on that, wouldn't it? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And so it's um, that just is me. Just I think confirming that that mindset of you know where you where you feel you feel lucky and you also like it's like I said I would like nothing more if there's any like true like path that I have is I would like to take and I've been reflecting a lot on this ten year mark like those things that are very natural perhaps to your approach on luck mm. and what you tried to do with business, those very youthful things that were kind of like kind of brilliant in hindsight because it, it, it but you didn't know you're just no, going for it. Not. And those things, man, the older you get, the further you get into your career, you have to keep like unlearning. Yeah. And reinventing that, yourself, you know, yeah, keep throwing yourself back into it. You know, like yeah. um, one thing I've noticed lately is um, with people that are super successful that I believe in, in my definition of success to, let's say, someone that's sort of struggling a little bit more. The people that struggle always say like, oh, what's the ROI on this? How much money are you going to make back? How are you going to make money on this? Like that idea, like who's going to pay for it? And they're always obsessing over these things. And the people that are super successful, it's always like, well, I'm going to do the thing regardless. And then the thing's going to work out. And I think about that, it's like you went busking, you went literally on a train in the middle of nowhere to go to probably play with 20 people in the backyard where most people would be like, why are you doing this, right? I would have definitely, like if I think financially booking a flight, like I don't even know if there was No, it tickets. didn't work out. Like I'm saying, it wasn't, it, on an economic level, there was, it made no sense no whatsoever. Sense. Yeah. yeah, and so like everyone that I know that's super successful, they do it regardless and it never makes any sense. And then that's how they get into this space where they happen to be in the right place at the right time all the time because they're not looking for ROI. They're not searching around looking how they're going to make money out of this or looking for anything more than like, 
I've got a calling, I've got to go and do this, I'm serving people, that's my purpose. And then from there, there's opportunities that always come your way. Now I think that's just such a beautiful thing. And it's, I think as human beings, I don't know why, but we always look for threads in conversations with successful people that we deem successful. And we always try and find the common denominator so we can sort of follow that path. And for me, it's the thing that I've noticed. No one successful has ever asked me, what's the ROI on that job? Why would you do this? How are you going to make your money back? They always say, that's a dumb idea. Definitely do that. That sounds amazing, you know? And they just know it's going to work out. As long as you're passionate and you're out, and you're out there making something happen, it's going to work. I think it's that intrinsic value, you know, the, that someone actually is pursuing it because it would be something that would um it's something that has to happen you know makes me think about the little poetry book that i put together and that was a really good refresher on i was doing that for doing it i was writing poetry for writing poetry not because i was necessarily going to do a book and necessarily delve down that path and i did in the end but the first reason i did it it wasn't because yeah because it'd be you know this makes me think about songs in particular um Springs to mind saying about songs. If you asked me to sit down and write a song, I said, "Okay, like, can you please write a song? Like, mm. so, I'm gonna, so I need you to write a song a day. Or I, I, I need, I want you to go sit down and write a song. Like, that's 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 daunting. Yeah, it's hard work. Whereas, like, <laughs> if you're like, hey, like, can I can I go sit down and always write a song? Absolutely not. And it would be a lot of pressure to actually be a bit of a like. I think it would be a bit of a hindrance. But if it's to go and express myself through writing or playing, like. That mm. I can do. That I can do every day. Yeah, you know, and there's no very, expectations on it. That's very different to being like, I need this outcome. You know, mm. and there's so many. I mean, I don't know how many, and it's so many, particularly in music, and it would be the same in photography. It's just like, oh my god, the amount you invest and risk, and you just run run risks. You know, constantly, and that would be something that I think, you know. You you take big risks, you can have big rewards, you know, mm. and you you take little risks, you're probably going to get little rewards. Like you kind of get what you're putting out there. And um, Have you always had that mindset? Like even when you first started? I think even more when I first started. Yeah. I think that's the thing that creeps in once you've been involved in business. Because now you stand to lose something. Yeah, it's like, um, and there's other people involved, you know, when you, you know, like I co-founded the label with my family and of course you mm. start to, more than m me, you start to be like, okay, like I want this to work for everyone. Yeah, right? for And sure. that's to say like, because for me, and I get this impression with you, it's like, you know, like I will still, like if you ask me to like, if you're like, okay, everything's, everything's gone to absolute, you know, everything's completely fallen over and like you're gonna you've lost everything, you're gonna have to like live in your van and go start again. Like I would. I could. And yeah. that's why I love to still go busk today. Like I still know know that I can. I've got the grit and ability to do that. Um but you do it's just man, this the the safety factor starts to creep in and it's so insidious. The safety factor does and there's like it's funny you just it, you know there's actually studies shown where it shows people if they um like where their ceiling of success is and it always comes to where they deem themselves where they've got too much to lose so it gets like basically get to this pivotal point and then there's all of a sudden you've got too much to lose so for instance if you're a day trader and you're just trading money and you're on the share market and you get to a million a lot of the times like if you deem that's a lot of money now you stand to lose a million where before it like there wasn't much and so with success is the same thing so we hustle and we put everything on the line until we get to this threshold where we deem we got some success and then from there we start it we um the driving factor is it's harder to and scarier for us to lose something than it is um to gain something like the reward to gain something a little bit more so for instance if you're like and it, it comes back down to this. If you're down to your last $100 and I said to you like, hey, I've got an opportunity here. It's 50-50. You might lose 100 or you could double your 100. Most people will say, I'd rather not lose my 100 than double it. Because if I lose it, I stand to lose like tonight's dinner, where I'm going to stay, everything else. But if I gain 200, it doesn't do much for me. 
to be honest. And so when you get to that level of success, it's like I could gain a bit more, but if I stand to lose everything, I mean, that's a lot. And so people that get the tremendous amount of success when we see like A-grade celebrities and things like that, their threshold is much higher where they're willing to risk more and more. Or say, for instance, someone like Elon Musk, willing to like, he gets a hundred million and that's not even enough. So then he just like keeps risking, gets to a billion, not even enough. Got to a hundred billion, it's not even enough. He'll probably get to a trillion because in his mind, he hasn't made it yet. And so he stands to gain so much more than he loses. Mm. Yeah, I find it fascinating. It is. It's really... um it's funny how, to me, it just keep, it ties back to this um, this thing of safety and also your confidence in being able to go in, to be able to go and make it again. You know, if you're like, oh, man, I just think I make, oh, this conversation just makes me think to like the amount of the amount I had to lose, like the amount that particularly, and this mm. is why people sign to major labels is because when you got to front a tour, yeah. Or yeah, front the footings for your um, for your next album, for your next album, and everything like that. Merch, and it's anything. so funny because what it takes. And this is probably the same. I can imagine being a lot of business, but it's like I've talked to other people about. It. It's like, for example, the ten grand threshold was something that was like, if you could somehow save up enough and just not spend it on drinking, don't mm. spend it on drugs, just do your work, get out of there. Like you still get to have a couple of beers if you want. Just don't be silly, you know. Mm. Like go do it. If you could get to that point, you could get the CDs, you could get the flight to Europe, you could do this, and you could just reinvest. It was just funny, there was just this threshold where, and then you could keep reinvesting it in again and again and again. But if you didn't get to that threshold, then it was just always, then you get the loan, and you just were just, mm. and that's not to say that's the wrong way to go, it's just to say that like, oh man, like if I think about there's, there's risks I can't even discuss that like, I look back and go, man, I was crazy. But I had, I had nothing to, I had nothing to lose. Yeah, there's nothing to lose. Yeah, and that's that's the thing to retain, and that's the thing that's, I think, immensely challenging. To do you do anything right now to sort of re spark that for yourself? You know, in your own mindset and everything. Actively, I've just been reflecting a lot before um, the next big like the rest of the year which is with a lot of touring and a lot of shows I've just been reflecting upon the I've been reflecting I've been just reflecting a lot about the things that we're talking about now and Mm. again taking opportunities like you know bumped into you busking hilariously yeah yeah as we bumped into the beach the other day which is why I'm here talking to you now case in point it's short answer no I am However, I am reflecting upon those moments that you have that are um, your initial reaction before you grew up. Your initial mm. reaction is probably something more akin to like your inner child about like, well, I've got nothing to lose. That's still the case today for you, for me, like, mm, you know, and, for sure. and lucky and look, and people have without a doubt and people have way when you got like little mouths to feed for example when you got a family like that's like i said like seeing all the people around me who do have families like it's a different level like as far as it's a different level and i'm still um at a place where like i'm not but what i can what i can understand in small passion these people are grown adults they can look after themselves but i do feel responsible to my family i do want mm. my family my friends who work with the label like i want us to have the best thing you know of course and I'm reflecting at this point upon shifting and re-engaging because it's easy, man. It's like, it's so easy to, it's so easy to start um, taking minimal risk options and part of your soul just dies. Yeah. He's like, you, you, and you know, well, it's just that the you receive. You, also the second you take anything for granted as well. Yeah. Hey, get Absolutely. comfortable. You know, it's going to work. You walk out, you play a song, you know, it's going to work. It's just, yeah, so it's it's that for me, and I, I could be hanging too much on the 10-year thing, but for me, it feels like a very reflective period and I've needed to just like mm. keep reflecting. And that's been a part of just even coming down here, coming yeah. down here from up north, you know, um, based in Queensland these days, and just even coming down here and just walking some of those same paths and having these conversations, I know, okay, it's not like, like I was like, didn't didn't put out a hat busking. There'd be nothing wrong with it, but I didn't put out a hat busking the other night. Like there's no 
besides a nice little clip for social media, there's no, like, I just really like doing it. Yeah. But what I like most is when you put yourself there, you get to have inspired conversations and someone mm. will say something, remind you or, you know, um, yeah, re-inspire you or remind you of something that you've forgotten. And that's like, that's where I'm at. And the thing I take from this conversation is just like, what exactly do you have to lose is the big question for everyone yeah. you know it's like what do you re- what what do well, you hey have what to if lose? you lost your passion i mean you stand to lose that <sighs> if, you, if you don't keep pushing and then that could be the death of everything you're like a buddha with bangs man so. <laughs> <laughs> i'm just thinking right now i'm that's, like what do you stand to lose i'm like if i lost that like that's I, not your new insta bio yeah. five minutes after we're done here <laughs> yeah Butters with bangs that's you know anyway that's our new venture um <laughs> no it's man you're right that is the that is the scariest because that thing. will that would not only would your family like your family wouldn't actually care if you lost money and if everything yeah. lost because you know things move on but if you actually lost your passion for what you're doing i, I believe your family would actually care so much more oh yeah I'm if it like, turned into a machine they i'm so i'm so lucky that i'm so so lucky that they like and that's something I'd say, you know, um, you know, surrounding yourself with people that care m- more about you than the thing that you're selling or yeah, the product exactly. or the song, you know, like people. And f- formatively, particularly, I think the crowd has cared, like the, pe- the people that are at grassroots screw this whole career with in the crowd, they cared, I feel they cared about me. Really, they did. Like it mm. wasn't just about that song or that tour. It was like, and when you do that, you just like, you feel so... Um, it just feels it just feels so beautiful you know and i'm really lucky that's pressure for me they're like hey if you hung up they're like hey if you need to like stop stop like mm. we like don't worry about us like we besides the fact that they're like i'm um, like they they more look up they more look after me i like i'm i bring the ideas i make a bit of chaos a bit of mess you know and they're yeah. the ones who like these days more and more reorganize iro- it. ironically i'm becoming more of an artist further mm, than into my career it's awesome like, you know, an all-in-one kind of person to branching out, branching out to being like now. I'm more and more more in your superpower. Directing and artist, like that's kind of where I'm at. I'm like have um, immense help. So that's wow. Yeah, that's well. Beautiful. You know, another thing is like when you stand to gain, like lose something. Um, a good story that I heard was Matthew McConaughey, and he talked about how he, he was like at his peak at doing rom-coms, but he was sick of it. And then he got an offer to do it for like, I think it was like 5 million. And he said, no, then it, like the next movie, then it was like 10 million. Then it went to, I think 13 million. And you might need to fact check me here, but I think it went to 18 million. And he was like, I can't believe they're offering me this much money. But he was wanting to say no. So then he could go in and reinvent himself in his career and everything. And I think about that story because so often sometimes we need to lose something to get to the next level of ourselves so like your career you need to lose something you need to lose some money you need to lose something that you're doing now that's not serving you or um like whatever it is and then from there it'll give you the space to be able to like ask the universe for the next thing and give yourself that space because you know nothing's going to happen for you if you just keep pounding every single day touring doing another show doing another show doing another show and it's not until you have the breakthrough moment of like oh my god i stand to lose something i could have lost something i did lose something i need to change something i need to reinvent rewrite redirect whatever it is and then that's where your next level will be i think about it makes me think about when i stopped touring in 2017 yeah i remember i remember the conversation um with my sister and my dad um and i was like this pre-label you know but i was like i need one week i was like i need a week like i'm losing it i need a week mm. you know and annika was like you know she was like are you sure you need a week because she was like she had this huge offer the biggest festival offer i had on the table and you know and what and it wasn't sure if we had because we didn't wow. at the time have the to go push it back a week you know which in the end everything worked out of course yeah. but i was like I need a week, like, because I'm losing my, I'm losing my mind here. Like, I need, I need wow. to just stop. For, I just need to stop for a week. And, and it was funny in that, you know, I took some time off, had some, had surgery on both my eyes, and so I took a pretty big period of time off. It might have been like, it might have, for touring wise, it might have been 
eight months the longest i'd ever taken right? eight months wow which is you know which is like so here you are you've grown things you're playing the, in the middle of your career eight months off is a big deal i'm uh, not really stage so it was cupac theater in brisbane it was you know i'm playing it sold out like people finally coming with offers vultures and you know, <laughs> yeah that was my vulture sign um, yeah yeah the vultures are coming in um seagulls are everywhere <laughs> and you know, and I stopped touring with it then. That gave us time to consider. I nearly signed. I nearly, as in, I had was lucky to have some major, some major label stuff, some other independent labels, and I mm. strongly considered signing because there were great offers. And um, I thought about you know someone who I'm not like intimate with all his work, but I thought about Chance the Rapper, who at that time was you know the biggest independent artist in the world, and mm. at least until a while after that was still independent, doing a lot for his city, and so t- totally different genre, but I liked his ethos. Mm. And and that's when we decided to form, you know, um, the label, the record label, and that couldn't have happened if I kept touring. We just wouldn't have had the exactly. Time. And so and that and that, if you think about that decision, like the way uh, the degree of impact positively that's had you know like mm. i lost out on touring i mean even the last couple of years it's just so crazy because you just don't know you know as far as the last couple of years where we couldn't tour internationally and the whole world was shut down like it's like okay well i'm gonna do get get even more in shape really work on my health and stop somewhere for the first time which is huge stayed in one place um not because I like the reasons for it, but I like the fact that like, instead of being 50 and stopping for the first time, yeah, I like really got happy going to the farmer's markets and having my little suburb and like doing my thing. Like it was, it was good. I'm confident now. Like I enjoy the road and I know how to enjoy time back off the road. And, you know, we're going back and doing, I mean, I'm going to go do a place in London called the Brixton and that's like five, four or 5,000 wow. people. It's going to be my wow. biggest overseas show ever. And that's Unreal. on the back of, not you know that's on the back of not touring technically in the yeah. uk for four years and that's just to say that there is some chance i could have had the mindset that like i'm right right have me able to tour everything's going to you know but i didn't have that mindset didn't have mm. the mindset that like it necessarily had to go that way i didn't have the mindset that by stopping shows by stopping shows that that was necessarily negative you know and if i if of i course. did if i did if i went right so if stop touring that's going to be that's going to be the end of things i have to keep touring mm. um, if i did that in 2017 i wouldn't have formed we wouldn't have formed the label and i wouldn't be i wouldn't which i think i owe so it's funny because you you directly like know this experience of like letting go of something to to bring in a whole new something bigger and you're in a space right now where it's been 10 years where you're reflecting right now you're on the road you're doing all the things but again like you're probably thinking and working out and all this downtime when you're just out there surfing and everything it's like I know that just pound, like what got me here today is not going to get me to where I want to be tomorrow. And so right now there's got to be something that changes. Yep. I think the, the, it is easy. I mean, it, the thing you really stand to lose, like you said, is your, is your passion for it. And you have, you know, it makes me think about, it makes me think about those important times that maybe they just come around X amount of years, you know, like, Makes me think about 2015 was a pivotal moment because I remember really having to get clear about like what I was doing and what kind of why. And then I got clear on it and it was like, you know, it was yeah. a, a real challenging moment. And that's where I'm in this little bit of a void at the moment, which, you know, thankfully makes me think of shout out, you know, shout out Mama Kin, um, Danielle, who I bumped into when I was in the desert on a surf trip in mm. the northwest of Australia just uh, um, about six months ago. And she's like, yeah, man, you're just in the void. You just got to like, just, just don't rush out of it. It's a beautiful place. And I think, um, with wow, a big that's, thing, that's yeah. amazing. And, you know, and I think with such a big, with, with tour up ahead of me and again, this very reflective time, uh, just getting clear on what you stand to lose and what you keep wanting to like bring to the world with music. Cause I do think it'd be enough to say like, I just want to go. I think one of the ultimate things is that it makes me happy on a deep level mm. and I feel like it's contributing to the world in a way and I feel like there's a net positive result that people might feel heard. Like that would be enough. That's, a, that's enough. That's probably the reason. That's probably like when you start peeling the onion, that's probably the reason for music. Um, but getting and feeling really clear about that and seeing when you, seeing what does totally dim that passion 
trying to avoid trying to to not go down those paths where you feel like you're just cut like that dying bit slowly you know? you know like well most people don't cut it out because those are the bits that pay money and so that it always comes down to that like if i just if i just didn't do that i'd be so much happier but i need it because it brings me a little bit of money or, or like you know i hear that all the time and so the one of the ruthless things and morgan knows is that i do in my career is like i'll make a lot of money doing something and i'm the first one to go like no nah, we're not doing that anymore and my team's like what do you mean this is what the thing i'm like we're just not doing it anymore you know like and that's the end of it and everyone always thinks that i'm mad but i'm like man the madness is if i lost my passion for what i'm doing every day because then it's all over yeah it's also to be said how I guess we shouldn't be surprised. Like that is the rhetoric though. The rhetoric of largely like where we're at is that it's not taught in school circling back. It's not taught mm. in school. Like, Hey, your spirit might die. Like do some yeah, shit and so have relationships true. that have relationships, do things that like you want to wake up, you know, like I was last night unnecessarily, you know, up to like one thirty Cause I was actually just too excited about a couple of things. I was just actually like, Mm. I was actually just ruminating. I'm yet to call my shaper. I was ruminating. I just had like a breakthrough on, on a new board design, and so I'm there like one thirty in the morning, trying to fall asleep, just laughing, going, "You, you idiot!" You know. <laughs> um, but your your heart's alive, and that's important because um, for me it's important, and why these trips, like these little hiatuses, are important for me because, like, there's nothing, nothing's kind of more distasteful, dis, you know, like distasteful for me than. I think what people enjoy about my music, what I, f- I think ultimately is that they represent a certain amount of like adventure and real um, and rawness kind of thing. And like, I have to fill my cup, you know, and lucky to have a team that like are pushing me to be like, dude, you got to go, f- you got to go fill your cup. However that is, you know, and that's like, um, that's something and filling my cup for me is like some aimless wandering where you, we want, we want plans and I want plans at least I want plans and I want things to be in order to curb some anxiety yeah and to be in control you know to give you the freedom to have things the chaos but literally (laughs) literally, if you like if if you ask me what makes me like like the things that evidently make me happy are things on the edge of chaos you know and so it's like it's funny how we have this split well I can only speak for myself having this split where you like in one part you like I want things to be safe. I want people around me to be safe. I want people to be happy. Like, how can I make this happen? Mm. And then, um, as far but as far as I go, the moment things are like, the, the moment things are kind of too um, predictable. I'm like, okay, like, I'm bored and I'm dying. We need to mix this. We need to we need to mix this up. Kind of that same sentiment. I've definitely had lots of funny conversations. Been like, don't want to keep doing that. You know, like, no, nah, just don't yeah. want to keep doing that. There's so many, so many fantastic arguments. And I mean that in a good way. So many great arguments. And yeah, but it just, I, I, do you, do you feel, how do you feel like you've retained? How do you feel like you've retained growing up? You know, when you, you see things, those things you didn't see before. Let's say you take risks now and you can see more clearly what it means. Because there's plenty of mm. risks I took where I didn't really know what it meant. I didn't know the full breadth and mm. then you get old enough or wise know, enough wise enough, <laughs> or you know or just like experiential and you make the quantum leap and you go oh it means all of that mm. how do you is there a way that you continue to find that place in yourself yeah there to is risk it? for me it literally comes down to me putting myself in the space of not knowing anything again so like it's for instance like you know, you take a big risk in something and it's, you, it's, you've seen it happen before, it works out and you can move forward and you do something, you do something. And then what I never know is what if I push myself into this space where I have no idea, then all of a sudden I've got none of my past knowledge to, to back myself or anything else. So now I'm stuck out there again. And that means I have to learn to swim again. It's like going, it's like, you know, going into the deeper, deeper end and then going like, how do I, how do I navigate this? And of course I've got my... I have the confidence in myself because I've got a, you know, my lifetime of like what I have learned and the things that I've done and how I've been able to navigate things. So I do believe I put myself in the unknown once again, that I'll be able to somehow navigate myself through it. But for me, just to answer your question, like I literally have to keep putting myself in that space 
where I'm scared because I have no idea. And that's the space that I love. It's the only thing I know, <laughs> actually. Yeah, that's a really that's a really special way to put it. It's that habit, isn't it? It's just a habit to keep being willing, you know, to keep being to keep being willing. I think having, and I think having your uh, having your reasons as 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 to why seems important. And yeah, that, for like sure. I said, having that. And having that personal drive that like at the end of the day from what it sounds like to me is that like you like doing that for the sense of like there is a certain amount of adventure and of course there's, and, there's, mm. there's, there's, and running that gauntlet is something that actually brings a bit of excitement in your life yeah people i think are scared like i think we have to i mean not all, there's i mean there was maybe it was joe rogan who said like basically you have to invite a certain amount of um like conflict in this term he meant like challenge and struggle in like for him it was training Mm -hmm. you know whether it was running or something that was like i have to i have to be i have to invite that in and do that otherwise i'll create it the rest of my life and that's why Mm. i think i'm one of the things i'm immensely thankful for with music is there's like enough i think there's enough chaos in it that it helps me not invite too much of it in other areas of my life you know there's enough natural it's such an intense thing and like horses for courses you know I think it does take an intense sort of personality to want to be independent, run your own business and do those sort of things. Of course. Um, but immensely rewarding and we're just in, we're in a bit, pretty funny time, particularly in Western culture. We're in a pretty funny time when it comes to, you know, the world, the world at our fingertips. And you know, maybe it was this, maybe it was this guy who was this awesome jujitsu dude and he was talking about how like, Who's like, I choose to struggle. Like I'm choose to be here struggling because I'm fortunate enough to choose that. Yeah, and you're I, privileged enough. I'm privileged enough to choose the struggle. To choose the struggle. Because yeah, kind that's... of it's like either you mm. like either you've got it you're and in you it. are struggling and people do have real struggles. And there is like talk about now, particularly in Oz, I don't know what the rest of the world economy is like, but my inkling is like that's real. There's hundred percent real. You know? And so mm. if you're lucky enough to not be an immediate thing than like putting yourself in that position like you said putting yourself in that position again i even heard someone say the other day it's like if you're privileged enough to take on board other people's struggle mm. so it's not only only your, yourself so if you're in a position where you can listen to someone if they're having a breakdown or you can like help them out if they're in time of need or something like that it's like you're privileged enough not only to handle your own struggles but to actually handle other people's struggles and hear them out and i thought that was for me it was very profound it's it's amazing and i'm sure there's there's people who have been trying to write about this for a long time you know you're um me sitting here absolutely exhausted you know like but it's funny my my back either my back either i'm a bit sore from getting slammed like surfing or mm-hmm. running or this either i'm a bit sore from that or i'm sore because i haven't done enough activity Mm. that just touches again it's just like that same for me it's at least it comes back to that same thing it's like either your knees are sore because you've been running or your knees are sore because you've been sitting too much mm. like that is that is that is the uh, that is wow, like, you can use that for your whole life that is it? the that is the laughable that is the <laughs> laughable situation we face the like the hilarious i think that like is am i am i overwhelmed and overworked and stressed because i've been working too much or too little yeah because i think sometimes i'm like well if i worked more i would have more work and then i would have i would have how would I have to market less and advertise less? And then like, I would have more clients. And, and I think about it all the time. I'm like, am I doing too much or too little? Because burnout can come from both. We definitely, <laughs> I hear you. Yeah. We, particularly if you're a personality, you know, like that's something I, something I was happy this summer to recognize. Like I need a project as mm. far as like, whether it's just a little one, whether it's about like, you know, I ran 11, 11.4 Ks with my brother. It was, you know, maybe 400 meters elevation. And, you know, he's training for an ultra. You know, he's like, wow. you know, he's, 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 that's what he does. And I was training enough to do that with him. And that was my little thing. That was my little project, you know. Um, you know, I finally, I'm proud to say I got past. Instead of hate filing my receipts, I now file my receipts happily. I even enjoy it a little bit, you know? <laughs> that took me 10 years, you know? Like, that's a yeah, big yeah. deal. Like, I did it, <laughs> yeah. you know? Like, that's like, that. that's the stuff in my journal. People like, was Jack Johnson playing with Jack Johnson in your journal? It's like, yeah, but filing my receipts, that was a real, like... That was there. Like, <laughs> overcoming this thing, you know? Yeah. Um, and, oh, man, 
man, that's that's something. I mean, there's a great. I mean, there's this guy I love reading this this um, Buddhist dude, um, Tick Nuts. Han, I believe how you pronounce his name, sadly passed, and a beautiful writer. I carry his little Buddhist book with me all the time. I love just reading it over a coffee and I pull to a random page. And, you know, the art of rest, I have so much free time. Seldom am I restful. I technically have a lot of free time, mm. but I'm like so, such a switched on sort of personality. And it's on me to switch off, you know? Yeah. Or like you just said, maybe if you recognize that you need to, you know scratch that itch kind of thing thing. you know i've sat down yesterday and started transcribing apart for a new poetry book like Mm -hmm. that for me just brings me such such a cathartic thing it's technically work but i'm like but it makes me feel like I well that's what i mean and so then all of a sudden it's like you're burnt out because you're not doing the thing and then when you do the thing you're like oh i'm back in the zone i'm back in the zone i'm tired (laughs) i'm doing the thing (laughs) i have that exact same personality man like Uh, exactly the same (laughs) i love it i love it it's true no it's um (laughs) yeah our knees are sore when we run and our knees get too sore from being sedentary you know so we we must find you know that but the art of restfulness man it's something i'm Something I'm hoping as uh, time passes, I get a little, um, I, that's, you know, it's fun to have these things, you know, those are the things I think that keep your passion alive is these little, could just be, you know, like getting past my receipt, my receipt issue, man. I just would let them pile up and I was just so against them. Such resistance to them. That's like a big thing for me, you know, that makes me really happy to, and people would just be like, are you sure that's a big thing? It's like, yeah, it's a big thing, you know? And so it's like having these very trivial little, milestones in your life too mm. yeah, and far out the people you see gosh you know the people you see who really you know your health like your health and your um like happiness is too broad a term but it's like but in, in the very least your health in a really holistic sense when you're pain free you know when we're lucky enough to be sitting here not you know thinking of you know shout out to my younger brother rock who's you know um was living it you know and he's never done his ankle skating he's like you know incredible skater my stage manager and he just fractured his ankle in two places on his birthday on a birthday skate you know and he's just one of the most freakish skaters you've ever you know ever seen but it's like that makes you for a moment think it doesn't make me think he shouldn't have gone skating i think he he must he had to he has to do the thing thing. yeah has to do the thing there's risk involved and he's going to go do it and lucky Mm. to have parents that literally didn't want us like for example we're like we don't want to risk you in the system mm. <laughs> but they'll like go and clear the stairs skating at like seven <laughs> you know like they'll like go yeah. do it you know like so happy to have that combination but yeah it's always nice to return sometimes i find myself with a lot of mental noise and i'm like okay like am i in one piece like can i am i like pain free like that's in the, in the sense of like, am I not just dealing with anything chronic? You know, mm. how many people you see who are dealing with that? So it's just, uh, yeah, those those little things, balancing those things out, they are, man, so lucky. Very, very lucky. Ziggy, thanks for being on the show. Joy, a pleasure. Thanks for having Good me Good conversation. On. I feel like it needs to be, um, we need to catch up another time. Let's do it post-tour. Yeah, I can finish post-tour. I can go tour. On the world tour, we'll touch back in like... Yeah. Eight months or something. And I feel like you, you have a complete different outlook. Like, oh, yeah, nah, man. I just want to go and never do nothing again. Maybe I'll have, <laughs> I can maybe have like a mohawk and nipple piercings and we'll just <laughs> yeah. see, like, you know, and, I'll, and I, what I'll do is. Change like, your music. I'll come on and I'll be like, man, I'm, you know, like, I'll come on and basically be talking about how I'm just ready to totally quit it, go back to surfing. And that'll last for two months and then I'll be ready to do it again. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much for being on the show, man. I'm going to share your links and everything down below so everyone can find your music and they can blast it in their car and everything else. So talk to you soon. Thanks, Joe.